I am unashamed. What about you? So we're back. Uh, the band's back together, Jace. Yeah, it's back together. It's amazing that we all get back. I know. I'm pretty fortunate to be here, I will admit that. I told Phil this yesterday. So I don't know when this will be released, but we had Mother's Day a while back for y'all. But for us, it was yesterday. Yeah. And so I was telling him that, because I was in West Texas filming. Of course, it's hot now. And, Very uh, hot. It just like what, went to summer overnight. What these TV people do not realize is that treasure hunting is seasonal. We generally don't treasure hunt when it gets above 90 degrees for obvious reasons. It's too hot. You have earphones on. You're not keen to any kind of snakes and things like that. So I'm in West Texas. And the day before we started filming, on our ride out there to scout out the property, a I was going to say six foot, but in the spirit of non-embellishment, five to six foot rattlesnake Uh-oh. was in the area, we, we all saw him, of where we were going to hunt. That doesn't make for a good night's sleep. <laughs> <laughs> So on day or a uh, good day's hunt either when you know you're gonna be just you know so it was pretty grown up and so day two I guess of the filming I'm kind of away from the herd and I mean the people and I took a step I was looking to the right I had my metal detector I took a step pretty pretty high grass and about a four foot snake was I'd say six inches in front of my left foot. Hmm. The snake bolted up and to the left. I bolted simultaneously up and to the right. My jump was better than his. Because <laughs> when I landed, this rush of emotion came over me. Because look, I'm You've in had a- some close encounters before. And he didn't, it didn't look like he struck at me. He just, he just jumped to the left. I mean, it was like a, we both jumped in opposite directions. He didn't know what you were, but he was getting out of there. Yeah. What was strange though, and I was telling you this, I haven't had this feeling come over me in years, I guess. And I'm not sure what it was. I, it, I guess it might have been adrenaline. Because, I mean, I'm not scared when I'm in the woods. I've been in the woods my whole life. I'm not going around thinking, oh, you know. But something just, it just, from, it started at the top of my head and it went all the way down. It took me a couple minutes to like, why am I feeling like this? And so then I just thought, you know what? Thank you, Lord. And I'm going right back in these woods. <laughs> a five foot so, rattlesnake can make give you a miserable day and a few nights without I'm sleep. Sure, Phil, if that snake, if it had been a rattlesnake, I'm not 100% sure it was a rattlesnake. I mean, the grass was thick, it was a big snake. But you'd already and, seen a rattlesnake, so. Well, we saw two others right. going to and fro from just filming across the road. Probably in that terrain, it was a rattler. So. I was like, thank you, Lord. So, But it did trigger uh, quite the conversation because we had just studied the temptation of Jesus from the evil one who, I guess he indwelled a snake at some point, you know, mm-hmm. and, and the snakes were cursed. You know, you read your, just a little Bible 101, you know, he cursed the, God cursed the snake too. That's He's right. Like, now on, you'll slither around on the ground. So whatever the pre-cursed snake was, he wasn't slithering around like he is now. That's it. So that's interesting. So I overcame my fears, but it it brought up a, a quite the conversation because I was like, well, I overcame my fears. But in the back of my mind, I was thinking, but don't put the Lord God to the test here. <laughs> Where I think I need a meeting with these TV people. Let's. What are we doing in West Texas and? You know, May, and when it's 95 degrees, and that ground was hard, you know. Yep. You just, you hit it with your shovel, and it just, 
Well, that's the other problem, especially, yeah, baked, baked dirt. So it was tough, but I'm pretty sure. You have leggings you can wear that up, get up to about your knee that's snake proof. Yeah, you might have well, to. Well, I had hip boots on, which caused me to almost dehydrate because <laughs> yep. it was so hot. But that would have helped a little. What's funny is I crossed the creek. I had brand new hip boots on. I crossed the creek later, and my boots immediately filled up with water, brand new. And you're like, what What happened? Well, there's also a lot of thorn trees uh. in West Texas. <laughs> so speaking of our show, a few weeks ago, I think I gave a hint that our show would be released come summertime. I will say this. This is breaking news. Concealed. Breaking in, news. Concealed in mystery. <laughs> it will be released earlier than I anticipated. Hmm. So from the time that you hear me say this, I would think weeks, not months now. And just a reminder too, Jace, you were talking about that with your breaking news that uh, our podcast, uh, you remember, is up for the uh, – Podcast of the year in the podcast impact category. So you only got a couple of days left. You want to vote? It's klovefanawards dot com, and you got till May the twenty sixth. So if you want to vote for this as podcast of the year, be sure and get that in too. Yeah. So so Jace, I was gone. I had an event uh, in Alabama, a men's event. So I barely got back, but I had to preach Sunday. So like I, I noticed that I thought, boy. Wow, your schedule. Now, how did you do that? Since how, how did you prepare? Since well, you were already speaking. Fortunately, I had a couple of days home that week. I wasn't going anywhere else. So, what I did was after we did a podcast last week, then I spent a couple of days working on my sermon. So I got it pretty much ready, and I already had in my mind what I wanted to do for the men's thing. But then to execute that, especially on back to back days, and I was driving there because it was just kind of right in that circle. We're flying, it would take about the same amount of time. And I got to where now with the way the airlines are, if it's within six hours, I'd just soon drive it because I don't really trust that I'm going to get oh, there. We have the same rule on the TV show. Yeah. You know, if, you, if it's within six hours, we drive. Yeah. And this was about six hours away. But it went great. But I was like, you know, I was, you, you get a little bit tired, like you experienced when you're coming in off the road. But I was super excited about my lesson because. It was sort of a different approach. It's definitely the most unique Mother's Day sermon I ever did. Because, you know, there's, you don't have to preach about mothers on Mother's Day, but sometimes, you you know, there's several things in the text. You know, you could talk about Hannah. I thought that was sacrilegious not to preach on mothers on Mother's Day. To not do it? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. You could just mention Happy Mother's Day and then preach. Well, I'm it. just saying, Al, the only thing that could really be bad with that is to make all the mothers mad. Yeah, you don't want to do that. But I have noticed something but about— you had, a, you had a point in there about the, one of your points. Yeah, well, so that's what I was going to say. So, But I, I will say this, So, and I heard it at the men's conference I was at, not by me, but by some of the other guys. So with men, you tend to want to kind of just wear them out. I guess just because we're men, so we're like, we got to challenge each other. And But when it comes to moms, we're like much more like, oh, we love our moms, and it's a much more soft, subtle approach, but we challenge the fire out of the men. There's a big difference in Mother's Day and Father's Day. No, I've always resented that. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's I, I've too hard. That. Yeah. When, the mom, when it's mom's Mother's Day, the preachers, they're like, I mean, everything Aren't is, they great? is very articulate and beautiful, and you are awesome. Father's Day, it's like, <laughs> this. it's time for you to do something. Make it right. It's Stop true. Stop being the problem. Stand up. I mean, it, it's it's more. It is. I have noticed that. And then we even used to joke about it because I did the same thing for years. I would plan like on Mother's Day, we'd have a Mother's Day breakfast at, at church building where we meet and you know we would have all these great things for them and these funny videos honoring them and we'd feed them breakfast and then the father's day would be like ah donuts for dad grab a donut on your way out i <laughs> think I'm, I'm the one who brought that up i said i went over there because they 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 used to do that where they would you would go into a room what they call the the old order auditorium i don't know what they call it now Fellowship Center. The Fellowship Center, because old auditorium just sounded terrible. That's too hard to say. 
And I noticed that when I, because I walked by on the Mother's Day, and I thought, boy, you talking about a spread? Look at the food here. I mean, it was nice. And you'd have the men serving, you know, they'd all have the aprons on. Oh, yeah. And so I went over there thinking Father's Day, boy, we're talking bacon and eggs. And I was thinking, yeah. And it was just some donuts laid over there that had been there an hour. (laughs) (laughs) And no drink. So I brought it up. I was like, hey, what, what are we? I'm all for making the moms happy, but let's just... Let's do better than our old donut. Let's, you know, let's have someone frying the donuts, yeah. like, live. Right. And I can get into that. So, anyway. Well, you're right. It's just, uh, I, I, and I'm guessing it's because men plan this. I mean, I did it for years. And so. Maybe that's You're it. just thinking like a man. And so you got to challenge the fire out of the men, but you got to be soft and syrupy to the women. I guess that's, I don't know. No, I don't know. It was good. You did a good job. But, that- so, yeah, that my approach was, I sort of took, my my thought process was, so speaking of Mother's and Father's Day was, I thought, wouldn't it be neat if you t- looked at Jesus through two perspectives? And I got the idea from our podcast because we've been in the first few chapters of Luke. And we've really been focusing on the humanity of Jesus because mm-hmm. we've been talking about his birth. We talked about him being a little boy. And so it struck me that I thought, well, you know, it's Mother's Day. What if what if I looked at it, the Son of Man on Mother's Day and his connection to humanity? And then if we looked at him as the Son of God on Father's Day and more of the deity idea. So that was my idea to kind of bookend a picture of Jesus, one from his human perspective, one from his uh, divine or, or deity perspective. So, Which went along with the temptation. You know, the evil one was was challenging him as a man. I mean, he was, he was, he was trying to sow that seed of pride. I mean, look who you are. What are you doing being hungry and weak? He was like, you know, kind of saying, you're, you're a big deal, the son of God, but this acting like a man. Right. That that's a path you shouldn't go down. I mean, that was he was he was tempting him through pride not to be vulnerable. And let's face it, the the you're right, as the spirit of God led him out there, which we talked about, to but it was for him to face a a physical and spiritual challenge because the first thing he does is he takes a 40-day fast. I mean, I fasted before Maybe a week. I've never fasted for forty days, you know, and yet so forty day fast. I mean, there's two or three times you see it in the Bible. That's a pretty serious thing to not eat food for forty days. You bet you. I mean, well, it, it has a toll, that, and it challenges you at the base level of, of who you are. Let's uh, let's take our first break. So um, just recently, Jace, I spoke at a uh, a men's conference, and I love it. It was it was called uh, Men of Iron the idea about iron sharpening iron. And um, it was over in Alabama. And these guys came together. And one of the things that uh, came up in our discussion um, of talking to these guys is that uh, pornography is a huge issue uh, for everybody. And even Christians, unfortunately, struggle with it equally as much as non-Christians. It just, you know, people spend so much time on the computer. And, Dad, we've talked about this before. You know, there's a lot of good that can be done, like our podcast, but there's also a lot of evil uh, that's out there as well. And so, one long pass sometimes will alleviate things such as that. Look, and there goes, there goes the little black box with all the pornography on it. (laughs) Just, just chunk it and get it over. I was thinking, how is this related to football? (laughs) One long pass. It was like throw a touchdown pass. I'm saying if that's that's what you're doing, you're looking at a little black box that's got all this filth on it. Just chunk it, dude, and go on. Well, so I got good news for you, Dad. You don't necessarily have to pass it away because we've got a sponsor. But that would stop it, right? It would, but we've got a lot of people can't just toss it because they got to work, and there's things you have to do on the computer. So one of our partners and one of our sponsors, Covenant Eyes, has a way to be able to provide accountability for you on the black box. So one of the things I talked to these guys at this conference about was accountability, um, spiritual accountability and biblical accountability. Um, you know, if we confess our sins to each other, you find healing. And so that's a lot of what critical, was, really. 
you got to have it. You got to be able to have that. And so Covenant Eyes, that's what they do is they help provide that accountability uh, to be able to be on a device, but know uh, that they're helping you to monitor what your content is and what you're looking at. So I want you to check these guys out. Uh, great company, great organization. Uh, they're all about ministry, uh, which is what I love. You can sign up for a free 30 days of Covenant Eyes by going to covenanteyes.com and enter the promo code Phil uh, to get you started. And so this has software for phones, computers, uh, other devices, anything that has uh, online and the integrity that you need online, that's what these guys help set up for you. So we want you to check them out. I know there are a lot of listeners out there that are struggling with this. So we want you to connect with these guys. They've been doing this over 22 years with their software and their resources. So it's a battle for your family, boys. So be sure and check it out. CovenantEyes.com. Enter the promo code Phil. 30 free days of Covenant Eyes. So... In an interesting development for the Mother's Day where I started this. So Missy invited our parents and her parents and really the brothers of of the family to, to come. And so, but all that showed up was our parents and her parents, <laughs> which was kind of weird. I don't think we've ever done that before. Was just, uh, and so Missy was nervous. You know, I prayed for the meal. She cooked roast, uh, rice and gravy. What else did she have? Oh, she had some homemade bread. And, uh, she had a little salad. She had a salad. But she was nervous because she said, however this goes, I'm sure it's going to end up on the podcast. <laughs> but I've made peace with it, so dig in. I mean, she said that before... <laughs> No, I pray. That was that was a prayer. So the podcast discussion now is part of the description of the meal. Yeah, she was like, you know, if this goes horribly wrong, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure to be on the podcast. So I'll let Phil. Oh, and we had a king cake mm. uh, for dessert. So and Phil making- got another. Another cake. What? I, what was that? Yeah, well, that was that uh, a Mother's Day cake. One of my little granddaughters had. bought a cake by. She had baked for me. Which was kind of weird because it was Mother's Day. Yeah. But but maybe, maybe now we're honoring mothers and fathers at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Maybe the next yeah. generation is Just getting here. it right, Jay. So, uh, no, I thought it was really good, though. I thought the meal was good, and it was very enjoyable. And it was a funny thing. I found the most perfect card because it's always hard you know, at this stage, which, you know, I give my mom just cash because I call it dole out money. She's not going to use it on herself, no. but she's, and I make sure I, I give her like everything in, in twenties. Cause I'm like, just, just give it out 20 at a time. <laughs> and it, cause the last time I gave her as a kind of a joke, but being serious on, on her birthday because we had had an argument about, uh, and I shared it on the podcast. You can go back about a hundred podcasts and find it. It was quite the ordeal about when, remember when she asked, you know, if we, I wanted to fly with y'all somewhere because y'all were already going. I was like, yeah. So then when I got back, she sent me a bill for the flight. <laughs> so, I was like, do what now? <laughs> so anyway, which was fine, but I'm just saying, go ahead and say, do you want to split the fly? <laughs> I was right. more challenging the, hey, come ride with us. And then <laughs> when you're sending me the bill, that was kind of weird. So I gave her like $1,000 for her birthday, which, I mean, I know that's a lot of money. Right. But I was trying to make a point that it wasn't about the money. <laughs> I was just saying, let's be, <laughs> let's have some clarity on let's this. Let's be thing. open. <laughs> But then she had given out that thousand dollars, hundred hundred bill, hundred dollar bill at a time, right? Before the end of the day, yeah. So uh, yesterday, you know, I gave her some twenties. I was like, "It's okay to dole it out. Just do it twenty at a time." <laughs> but I, you know, and so I just get a car because I've been out of town for weeks, and I mean, I think, and she's fine with that, yeah. But I found the perfect card for her of all the cards I've ever given her. And you're not going to believe what it was. It was a picture of Wonder Woman. Hmm. And when you, and and it said, uh, it was a quote from Wonder Woman about 
somebody saying that she was a hero. Well, I had done a sermon years ago, and uh, and I was like recognizing unsung heroes, you know. And of course, Jesus is the ultimate hero, you know, of our of our soul and life. But I had picked three women who who I viewed as heroes. One of them was my mom. Yep. she was there in the audience, you know. And boy, she cried. And so I was like, I have a Wonder Woman card, and you said, well, "What's the significance there?" And you remember this probably, El. Oh, yeah. When we were, I guess we were early teenagers. I think we've shared this story before. We had this big poster in our room of Wonder Woman. I was a big fan. Yeah, I was too. And one day we go in there and I'm like, what has happened to our poster? Somebody had taken a black felt pen and colored in the cleavage on the poster. And extended the bloomers to make them into shorts. Yeah, and to match. <laughs> and I, which I was thinking, boy, I figured it was Willie or, you know, somebody just put, because, you know, Al and I really liked that it poster. It was your grandmother. <laughs> no, mother. it was, it was, your mother. It was Kate. Yeah. yeah, it was. Your mother. But it took an investigation. Because oh, yeah. I never th- thought she would do that. And so, because we kept, we felt more like it was defacing our property. Yeah. <laughs> so I, so I got the card and I put, uh, "You've always been my hero." You know, I love you, Jace. And then I put P.S. and I drew an arrow because inside the card there were like different. They were black and white photos of Wonder Woman. I drew an arrow and said, "Feel free to color in the cleavage." <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, well, I thought about it, Jace. That's a somebody put out a meme the other day, which fit this perfectly. It said my era and had a picture of Linda Carter as Wonder Woman, which that was who was on our poster. She was the Wonder Woman from the seventies, and it said your era, and it showed one of the current you know trans people on here that's that you see a lot, and it said wonder if it's a woman. So that's that that's kind of the difference in the two eras, which I thought was pretty. Yeah, that's uh, pretty clever. But anyway, yeah. So Wonder Woman, mom was trying to help us. She she didn't want us to. I guess she was our early covenant eyes. She she was. Yeah, it was funny. She didn't want, uh, she didn't want us less than over. A I mean, to be honest, once she gave her speech about it, I didn't have much to say. You know, she was just like, "I'm making a spiritual decision, and that woman's outfit is cut too low at the top, and it's too high at the bottom." <laughs> But I'd always kind of, like, I'd okay. always had a thing for Wonder Woman. I think I've told this story before on the podcast, but actually, my mother in law broke me of it because when we used to have the trunk or treats, she came dressed as Wonder Woman hmm. in a, in a kind of a skimpy outfit, and she was at this time in her late seventies. And I took one look at her, and that was it. I was like, "All right, I'm over it." <laughs> 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 you did it. You broke you broke my my yeah. <laughs> you broke my idea. She did it. Yeah. So that was kind of a running joke in the family. So anyway, back to my lesson, Jay. So it was it was called the Son of Man, our brother from another mother. Um was kind of just a clever way of saying it. But and I, I had four points. The first one was what we talked about with relating to him as as a human being that had a mom. You know, he had a mom. She nurtured, she cared for him, she carried him, she nourished him, the same as us. And and it made me think about that text in Galatians 4, born of a woman, born under law. You know, Paul made sure to mention that. The second thing, second point was the one you've already brought up. He relates to us because he knows what we're up against. And that's when he got into the thing with Satan in the garden, I mean, uh, in the wilderness and later in the garden. Because remember, it said he left him for an opportune time. Mm-hmm. We talked about that on the podcast that I think that transferred forward to that moment he has in the Garden of Gethsemane when he's basically saying, is, there, is this it? Is this, are we doing this? You know, that was kind of that moment. And then that led me to the third point, which was he relates to us because he knows what we fear the most, and that would be death. I mean, without him— without knowing that death could be conquered and defeated, 
that's the greatest fear, right? Because the, and the Bible says that in, in Hebrews 2, that we were held in slavery by our fear of death. But the resurrection is what changed all that. And then the last point was he relates to us because he gives us his spirit when we're born again. And so I made the point that even living in this life, we have an opportunity to live a resurrected life because we're basically paying it forward. He gives us the spirit of God as a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance, according to Paul in Ephesians 1. And so we think about it, everything in Jesus, this idea of the Son of Man, is he represents both the struggle we have and the victory we have as we kind of look forward. So that was my, that was my, the four points of my sermon. No, it was good. And even that Galatians 4, 4 and 5 you mentioned, we read that verse so much that you just, it's, it's almost diminishing to the power of that God's plan was going to be fulfilled at the right time through a virgin teenager yeah. <laughs> having the son of God in her right. and giving birth and, and going through the process. So I get it. For people who are not believers, they have a hard time getting past that. It's not like they have a better idea to say, you know, on the meaning of life and why you're here and what your purpose is and how you're leaving and these kind of questions. But I made the point, too, that, you know, that's what makes uh, Christianity unique in that no other no other world religion has this story of no. God becoming flesh and being one of us and then delivering us both from sin and also our fear of death. I mean, whatever you whatever you choose to believe, this is the only one that delivers on all the major things that we do. Well, right. you know? But most other religions is always about you measuring up. That's right. This is God coming down. And Get doing you. it for us. Yeah. That's exactly right. Let's take another break. Jace, how important is it to have a clean weapon, would you say? Well, I would say if you asked uh, Clint Eastwood playing the character of the good in the good, bad, and the ugly, he was cleaning his gun, and he heard men with spurs approaching his door. (laughs) Lost in that scene after he went pow, 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 pow was that he had just cleaned his gun. Uh-huh. And his gun performed admirably. <laughs> you know, I never thought about it, but back in the day, when you're literally your life depended on it, the clean weapon was pretty important. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh. I mean, today we think about just in terms of hunting or shooting on a range or whatever, right? People are always asking me why I'm bringing that up, but I'm constantly like for the little one that we we get to keep, you know, I'll do my, I'll do my little dove call that little, and then I'll whistle. (laughs) (laughs) So that's, I I thought that was pretty impressive. That's pretty good. I'm not trying to brag, but that that. is the theme song of the good, bad, and ugly. And maybe it needs to be the new theme song for our uh, ads for Barrel Buddy, uh, because that's where I was going with that, was that uh, this uh, company, uh, Barrel Buddy, that's a lot like us. They were, it was an idea out in the field, um, trying to use the old patches, you know, which is kind of a square peg and a round hole, uh, to clean gun barrel in a muddy, wet environment. And it just wasn't working out too well. And so, like us, when it came to duck calls, they came up with a better way. And that's what Barrel Buddy is. And so, for those of you watching the podcast, this is their product. I like it because it says, clean your gun without the grunge. Yes. Which is pretty good. So you can uh, see it uh, as these white polymers go through, what you're getting out of your gun barrel, which is important. They also have it for uh, every shotgun you could have or pistol. Uh, so for the, those of you that are gun enthusiasts, shoot a lot on the range. This is something you use to clean your gun. Uh, we love it. We love these guys. We love their company. I want you to check them out. It's BarrelBuddy.com is, is how you get their product. B A R R E L. Buddy, BarrelBuddy.com. Check them out. So anyway, the, my idea for that actually came from our study that we've been doing uh, in the book of Luke. And and you're right, Jay, it's kind of up to where 
uh, I think we left off in chapter 4, we had talked about him going to Nazareth. Which was interesting because in Mark's Mark's account, it has him going to Nazareth much later. Yeah. There are a few, there are a couple of things about that I was going to mention when we got there. Same thing with the, uh, the calling of Peter in, in chapter five, you find that a little bit different in place of like him healing his mother-in-law in some of the other gospels. So I don't exactly know what that is other than most people that I read have Luke sort of, you know, his description and style is to kind of tell you about who he's about to talk about, mm. you know, like introduce him. And then he tells the story, whereas the other guys are more chronological. Here's exactly the way it went down. Luke's doing it more, a little bit more as an idea about, okay, this guy, Peter, you know, here's who he is. So he mentions him first, and then he tells about his conversion. So He does say that here's what happened in and around his hometown in Galilee. And then there's a shift, I think it's in chapter 9, where it's like on to Jerusalem. Yeah. That's exactly right. Nine nine fifty is is where the shift is made. So I don't, you know, people say, oh, you know, I'm not sure the timing. I mean, look, you can get these are from four different perspectives. None of it is in opposition to each other in principle or who's the son of God. His name was Jesus. It's just a little different the way. That it's put together. Well, just imagine, Jay's, if you were if you were in the first century, and you you only got one look at this. Maybe you were in a setting where Luke had written this, and so you were reading the only eyewitness account that came through him. Whereas somebody else may have read Matthew, somebody else may have only read John. In other words, it wasn't like it was compiled so neatly like it is for us, All right. for those that were reading it. So the, plus, you got to keep that in mind. Plus, Luke seems to, because I went ahead and looked ahead, he just really seems to capture Jesus being for the world. Yep. You know, even when we read, you know, the angels' announcements, it's good uh good news to all men and he uses the two gentile illustrations in where we left off at his hometown which was this widow from wherever she was from it was hard to pronounce where was that from um uh, uh, Zarephath Zarephath yeah and which was up in Syria is, is where that was so she wasn't even a Israelite Yeah, and naming the Syrian. But that's what I'm saying. There's more of this. The more you're going to continue to read, you're going to see that he really reaches out to the poor, uh, just women in general. Uh, There's more conversation, at least 10 I know of, that he has this encounter. And the Samaritans... Various Gentiles. I mean, this you, well, you, even the you, first two chapters. I mean, we basically get the whole uh, birth of Jesus and John the Baptist as told through their moms, mm-hmm. which you know that's unusual because Matthew focused much more on Joseph in his version of it. So yeah, you, you're right. It's it's definitely told from a perspective of a broader view. Well, yeah. and in, just, in in the middle of all that, it it Luke starts in. Chapter 9, Matthew started in about Matthew 16, and, and Mark mentions it, and so does, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John mentions it, uh, and it's this. Uh, they said, Who, what about you? Who do you say I am? Well, when we get to chapter 9, Peter answered what all this is about. The Christ of God is what they said. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone what he was going to do. So somewhere in this, the evil one was hoodwinked <laughs> through what's fixing to happen. They, he strictly warned them not to tell this anyone, and he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law. And, and he must be killed. He's talking about himself. And these people are looking at him saying, do what? He must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. 
So the gospel is officially announced among all this. You get to chapter 18, we're going up to Jerusalem, the Son of Man will be, be, he'll be handed over to the Gentiles. They'll mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. On the third day, he'd raise again. So underneath all these teachings that he's given, you know, underneath all of that is the 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 the, the gospel of Jesus hidden for ever since God created the heavens and the earth. It's just now the salvation of the world is fixing to be at stake in a big way. All he talks about is how it's how it's going to be, how it's going to be. The the spiritual and the physical are fixed to come together, and it, it, it'll last, it'll never stop. And 2,000 years later, we're sitting here reading it saying, and it's still the wildest story as it was back then. Yeah, They were all confused about, you know, he's fixing to get into them and, you know, just a chapter or two, you know, all these the parable of the sower and the lamp on the stand and all these all these issues that come up sin sin death it's all covered just step at a time easy as it goes pretty amazing in the lair and i guess in the eastern lair where zach is we are littered with phil merch uh, blaze merchandise we're wearing shirts today uh, that are on philmerch.com because we want to encourage you guys to check out um, all of the apparel and the different things they have there. They also have these coffee mugs. Here's one uncanceled, unashamed. Zach, you got an unashamed mug up there in uh, North I Carolina, my, I right? My coffee, my hot coffee and a Phil mug, yeah. You know, one of the things by wearing our apparel does is it causes people to ask you questions. What is that? What is an unashamed? Who ever heard of that? So it just provides you an opportunity to tell folks about the podcast. I know that our podcast is a word of mouth thing. So that's what this merch is about. Uh, we encourage you to check it out. Phil Merch, M E R C H dot com. And it really goes back. He's to- building a foundation on what all this is going to be about. He's going to be, the, he's the king. And they're looking at him like, you're what? He said, uh, the king of the kingdom there. He, he, they're just shocked. The, the, you know, the whole underlying lesson, I mean, uh, preaching in that was repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. John the Baptist is out there hollering about it, you know, up to his death, and it never stops. And you're right, Dad. That last uh, podcast we talked about it, that was his message uh, in Nazareth. Remember, he had, he had read that text yeah. out of Isaiah. Yep. And it said, preach good news to the poor. He sent him to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recover of sight for the blind. And at this stage, they're saying, do what? Right. And then he just sits down, and they're like, he's talking about himself. And I mean, do they ever turn on him? They they, they decided to kill him on the spot. Well, his drop the mic line was, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. (laughs) In other words, that that would be me. Yeah, all the old testaments yeah, I've been reading about about me. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. They were like looking at these. And like, you're right. They went from astonishment. Look, they went after him to kill him on the, with that information. They took him to the cliff to throw him over the side. How to kill him? That's exactly right. So the bottom line: the chief priests and the teachers of the law and all of them. I don't know wh- how you would categorize them as far as their behavior, but I mean these were some mean people. Yeah. Well, but what they were mad about is because he wasn't considering them to be the audience that he was going to help. That that's it was a you know he 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 gave this character description of who he came to help, and he <laughs> he brings up two examples that people weren't even from their yeah. region. Yeah, right. It infuriated them. Oh, and. and one of them was poor, but the other one was rich, was also infuriated. I mean, it, it's like, what are you talking about? You know, the spirit of the, when he said the spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. Well, they loved that. But then he used the rich man as an example. Cause they, but they weren't following that he meant spiritually poor, yeah. which is, if you go back to read Matthew's account, 
you remember the Beatitudes, because he doesn't really talk about the hometown throwing off the cliff in Matthew. It does in Mark. But, and, and you go back and, and read, so right where Matthew's at in to parallel with Luke, I was going to read this. In Matthew 4, 23, so this is right after he says, I'll make you fishers of men, and right after the temptation. He says, Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, to your point, Phil. Yep. And healing every disease and sickness among the people. Yep. News about him spread all over Syria. Well, that that's there's your reference yep. to this, what happened in his hometown. Yep. He told this story about these two Syrians. And people brought to him... And here's why I wanted to read this. All who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. So I was only going to make the point that when we go back to Luke 4 and we get to verse 31, all of a sudden you're going to have this encounter with someone who's demon-possessed. And I wanted to read that in Matthew's account because I think people, kind of like they do with the evil one, they tend to be people of extremes. Because look, the million dollar question for all of us is people want to know is, well, does demon possession still happen today? Mm -hmm. or, or when did it stop? Yep. So luke seems to have more uh i know there's more parables in luke but there's also it just seems to be a lot of stories about people being possessed by demons right but when you read matthew's account what i was saying is there's a difference i think when you approach people's problems you know the extremes are either you know the devil's everywhere and doing everything you know or he's not real that just tends to be where people camp out in the, one of those two extremes. And I think it's probably somewhere closer to the middle. Right. I mean, he is powerful. He he does have an entourage. He is uh, filled with fury over, over Christians, and he does tempt, and, and there's an entourage here. You have demons, you have evil angels, you have the devil himself, uh, Ephesians 6 says you have rulers and powers in the spiritual dark world. Am I leaving anybody else out? Authorities on the yeah. the authorities, Roman, I mean, uh, Ephesians 6. Right. Yeah. Rulers, authorities. That, I mean, it's a. In both the heavenly realms. It's and, organized. Right. So, but you also have. Uh, you know, sometimes there's things that happen that's God's discipline. And I mean, like, that's why you saw there's diseases and there's uh, the things we just read from Matthew 24. I mean, the list, I mean, uh, Matthew chapter 4, the list was pretty long. He said, people who were ill, various diseases, those suffering severe pain, well, that could be a lot of things. Uh, I mean, what I'm saying is if you trip and fall, and you hurt yourself, and you're in severe pain. Or chronic, you know, just yeah, people have been in pain a long you know, time. That's just life. Life on yeah. a, on a earth in a perishable body. Right. And so you know, if you're wondering what my point is, I'm like, we, we try to assess blame, but right here in the middle of this, you have the demon possessed. Well, I want to know what that is. I mean, that's like, whoa. It just doesn't seem to fit. <laughs> Those having seizures, uh People have been paralyzed. Usually it was an accident, yep. but but Jesus was healing everything. So I wanted to introduce this idea because we're at 31 of Luke 4, and we have someone who is demon-possessed. So I'll read it, and then we'll discuss. Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath began to teach people. They were amazed at his teaching because his message had authority. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an evil spirit. And my little 
letter on evil says, uh, or unclean spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Ha! <laughs> you don't see that very often. <laughs> can't make this up. These people say you can make this up. Ha! Ha! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly, come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them and came out without injuring him. All the people were amazed and said to each other, what? What is this teaching with authority and power? He gives orders to evil spirits, and they come out, and the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. Spiritual has met the physical. These seize these strange people, and they're hollering about Satan and and the things they're doing. You're like, and and the and the the winner. Jesus is always the winner. Well, yeah. But Amen. if they had known, Paul told the Corinthians that he was going to save the world, they wouldn't have crucified him. Mm. They, 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 they wouldn't have got rid of him. They, they said, don't, don't, no, let him live, let him live. But he had to shed blood to remove sin. Yeah. So that's why when he, when he was saying, don't be telling anybody what's going on right here exactly right now, he was just sort of skating, but he was showing who was the boss. Well, it was interesting that they, they recognized him. Yeah. And the hu humanity didn't know who he was. Yeah, they saw him just as the carpenter's son. Well, and the demons a, identified him, but they, they did. But they, is, but they were admitting is, uh, super, you're, you're bigger than we are. Right. But it shows you that their demons are superhuman. It shows you that right there. Well, how because yeah. how they know that? That's right. Well, that's right. So, I mean, supernatural, superhuman, and and even in you, you know, because I went down a study, and what I studied. Because as I read ahead, there's just, I mean, we're going to get to Luke 8, and probably the most famous demon possession story, and we'll get it in, in detail when we get there. But here was a guy who, who didn't just have a demon in him. He had thousands. <laughs> I mean, I know there was, a, I mean, there was 2,000 pigs, or do we know that number for sure? I don't know why I read that somewhere, that it was, uh, but, you know, when the yeah, demon so said, we are legion... We are many. And you know, a legion, I think in the military, in the Roman I think era, legion. was like three to 6,000. Yeah, or something exactly like that. right, right. So I'm saying, I read somewhere that there was 2,000 pigs on that field, but I'm not sure that's a, a Bible word. But it was multiple pigs. So Yeah, the Luke one just says a herd. It doesn't give a number. Yeah. Well, we can, somebody, that, that'll that be easy to look up. Right. But... My point is, it was a lot in one guy. And so, uh, and here, it seems to be one, but this one's at a synagogue. And you can kind of, I think once you kind of stop and meditate on this story, because we've all spoken in front of audiences. What was he it, doing in the synagogue? Well, right. And just picture a guy who, well, he probably came to the synagogue because he had a demon in him. <laughs> Like somebody help me get this thing out of me. Or maybe now, the demon wanted to go there and find out what the other side was up to. I don't know. But just imagine this person staring at you. This weird. Because I, I think this is not made up. I mean, the guy had a demon. He's at the synagogue. Jesus is speaking. And this guy's looking at him like I'm a demon possessed person. And he was. And so finally couldn't have, he, he just, or, or maybe, you know, the words of Jesus or the presence of Jesus invoked this ha, <laughs> which I, so everybody in the room turns around to see where that came from. And he's like, what do you want with us? So that's why I said, I think we had a battle of wits going on in the spiritual world. Jesus had recognized this, and I mean, the presence of God brought this on, right? And I think because it can't coexist, there's got there's got to be a 
something's got to happen. This is combustible. The, right. the, the demon said, I mean, the, the book says, the Bible, the, 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 the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. <laughs> well, but before he said that, Phil, I think, it's, I think it's interesting that he says, the demon says, have you come to destroy us first? Which, a while ago when I said that demons, based on reading this and Luke 8 and others, they're supernatural, they're superhuman, they're a form of deity, but they're not the deity. You know, they were considered to be gods. Uh, I'm, I'm going to read this in the in the Old Testament. They were they had knowledge that surpassed humans, but they weren't the deity. And they acknowledge here when he said, "Have you come to destroy us?" Which means they get it that he's more powerful than they are. And in the Luke eight passage with the pigs. The first word is, have you, come to de- uh, have you come to torture us? Now, I'm not real sure what that means, <laughs> but in both cases, they knew who he was. And in all cases that you read, they quickly knew who he was. And they showed that he had more uh, authority and power over them. So in the Luke 8 passage, they said, don't throw us in the abyss, which seems to imply that was what the torture, mm-hmm. which these, you know, I read what people think, these scholars, they're like, well, he just meant throw them in the pigs that would then go into the lake, and you can make a case that the lake was the abyss, but, you know, I ain't buying that. I think he meant, they meant the abyss, as in like a bottomless pit, whatever hell is d- described as. Because the question is, once they are in the pigs... And they're, the pigs are drowned, so the pigs are dead, but what would that do to a spirit unless there was something that went on simultaneously? Well, it, the they wanted a body. Right. They're, they're, there's, they can't express themselves without a body. So that leads me to the question before we get into overtime, and we'll discuss this next time. What is a demon? So you would think that'd be easy to answer, but the more I studied, the more I look. Oh, my goodness. You know, there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot, but one of the books I remember when I read as a teenager was, uh, or maybe a little older, was Seeing the Unseen by Joe Bean. Yeah. We and would so, probably be been in our twenties when that came out. Yeah. Yeah. So I went back and read it and, uh, boy, it was very convincing. He, he, and I really recommend that if you're going to be with us through this study, uh, of Luke, you can get get that book. Every everybody sells that because Joe Beam is the author. Joe Beam seeing the unseen, and he asserts that demons are the wicked dead, the spirits of the wicked dead back on earth. Right, and made a pretty powerful argument based on scripture and, and old writings and historian right. writings. Because they're different from angels. I mean, there's no doubt. There's something different yep. than that. So He did assert that. Yep. So we'll discuss that moving forward. Yep. That'd be good. And uh, They were there. Are they here? Well, that's that's what we're going to get into. That's what we're going to get that's into. That's the question. We're going to give you the answers <laughs> and the options, and then you make up your own mind. So if you want to, we'll talk a little bit more about this in overtime. BlazeTV.com slash Unashamed is where you get our bonus material. So follow us over. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.